The Hardy Boys, The Sign of the Crooked Arrow, by Franklin W. Dixon, read for you by Brandon Reese Taylor. Chapter 1. The Abandoned Car. The Hardy Boys' is convertible, heading for the open country, whizzed past a road sign inscribed Bayport City Limits. Dark-haired, 18-year-old Frank fingered the wheel lightly. Joe, who was blonde and a year younger than Frank, sat beside him. What's all this business about somebody get forgetting a car? Joe asked. A man and his wife left it at Slow Mo's garage in Pleasantville two weeks ago and never called for it, Frank replied. The boys' father, Detective Frenton Hardy, had given Frank the details of the case and suggested that his sons follow it up. The garage proprietor had appealed to Mr Hardy to find the owner of the car. Why didn't Slow Mo contact the license department, Joe put in. Dad asked about that. Slow-mo says when he went to look at the number plates, they were gone. Who took them off? That's what we're supposed to find out, Frank said. Half an hour later, he pulled up in front of a rickety building in the sleepy town of Pleasantville. That must be Slow-mo, Joe observed, as a grey-haired man in overalls shuffled towards them. Hello, he greeted them. What can I do for you? When he learned who they were, he asked in surprise. Where's your dad? He's busy on another case, Joe replied. He sent us to help you. The old man frowned. I sure was counting on him. He's the best detective in this part of the country. You're right there, agreed Frank. But I think Joe and I can make a start on solving the mystery. We often work with dad on cases. Slow-mo, who had been dubbed slow motion in his youth, rubbed his whiskers with a grimy finger. Well, I don't know, he said. But come into my office and I'll tell you what happened anyway. What do the police think? Frank inquired. Didn't ask them, Slow Mo replied. Jake, the chief, is my brother-in-law. We don't get on and I don't want to bother with him. That's why I called your dad. The old man crossed the floor of the garage and entered a small room. It was stacked high with empty oil cans and, and old tyres. A faded calendar dating back three years hung on the wall. Looking at it, Joe grinned. Don't you have one for this year, he asked. Slow-mo smiled sheepishly. Never thought of that, he said and pointed to a couple of rickety chairs. Sit down there. The boys listened as he unfolded his story, most of which they already knew. At one point, Joe interrupted to ask for a description of the couple who had left the car. Slow-mo looked blank. Why, they were kind of ordinary-looking folks. Middle-aged, dressed like regular people. Do you know where they went afterwards? Took a train. The station's right over there, the garage owner replied. Pleasantville's uh, railway terminal, he added proudly. What's the engine number of the car, Frank asked. I don't know, Slow-Mo answered. Guess I should have looked. Never thought of that. At Joe's request, he led the Hardys to the rear of the garage where a black saloon stood in a corner. Frank threw up the bonnet and glanced at the engine. Got a torch, he asked Mo. When the proprietor handed him one, Frank scanned the motor. Just as I thought, he announced. M the engine number has been filed off. Joe opened the door and looked for the serial number. It was missing too. Why would anybody do that? Slow Mo asked, running his fingers through his grey crew hook cut. To conceal the identity of the car, Frank explained. This, he added, is a case for the local police, whether you like it or not. Reluctantly, Slow-Mo put in the call, and soon afterwards, a short, heavy-set man puffed into the garage. Hello, Jake, Slow-Mo said. These are the Hardy boys, sons of Fenton Hardy, the detective. What have they done, Jake asked. Want him arrested? No, Frank said, laughing. We'd like you to arrest the person who fouled the number off the engine of this car, he pointed to the saloon. Besides, the guy that left it here owes me two weeks rent, put in slow-mo. A determined look spread over the police chief's face. I'll arrest him all right. Where is he? That's what we'd like to find out, Frank told him. Slow-mo said he left here two weeks ago. Got rather a head start, didn't he? Jake declared. He examined the car inside and out, but found nothing. Then he took a fingerprint kit from his car and went to work on the saloon's steering wheel and dashboard. 
Most of them are smudged, he remarked, but we'll see what we can do. He turned to Mo. Let us know right away if anybody should claim the car, will you? Then he said goodbye and left. Frank spoke up. Suppose Joe and I look for some clues. Sure, go ahead, the garage owner said. Frank examined the car's upholstery while his brother rem removed the mats from the floor. Then Joe opened the glove compartment. It was empty except for a narrow leather strap worn at one end. A barely discernible design had been worked into the leather. Looks like a part of an old strap from a wristwatch, he commented, showing it to Frank. Wonder why anyone would save it? It may be a valuable clue, Frank said, continuing his own search. He pulled out the back seat and ran his hand behind the upholstery. His only reward was a hairpin and a dime. Then suddenly his fingers touched a hard object. Tugging carefully, he pulled out a piece of jewellery. A tie clasp, Frank announced, holding up the object. It's an arrow, but it's crooked, Joe observed. Slow-mo peered closely at the slightly S-shaped arrow clasp. Probably got bent, he said. I don't think so, Frank replied. Looks to me as if it has been made that way. Pocketing the piece of strap and tie clasp, the Hardys said goodbye to Slow-mo and got into their car. Just as Joe was about to start the engine, a man turned in from the road and walked into the garage. I wonder who that guy is, Joe asked. The stranger had broad shoulders, bushy black eyebrows and a large nose. Looks like a boxer. The boys waited a moment. Then they heard the men's voices from inside, arguing loudly. We'd better see what's going on, Frank said. Sounds as if slow mo's in trouble. They got out of their car and dashed inside. The stranger was snarling at slow mo. All right, I didn't leave it, and I don't care if the number plates are gone. I'm taking that car. With that, he gave slow mo a wallop. The elderly garage owner staggered backwards and fell. His head struck the side of a door with a resounding crack and he sprawled unconscious. Frank and Joe leaped forward. The burly stranger, surprised by their sudden appearance, halted abruptly. Then he whirled about and ran out of the side door of the garage. While Frank bent over slow-mo, Joe tore after the assailant. He was only a few yards behind his quarry when the man bounded up the steps of the old Pleasantville railway station. A train was just pulling out. With a lunge, the man grasped the handrail on the last coach, teetered precariously a moment, then pulled himself aboard. By this time, the train was moving fast. Joe summoned all his strength for a final burst of speed and made a frantic leap.